think of it this way. You're sitting in front of your tank, like the baddest tank. Yeah. And you're looking, you're looking at all the different life that's going on in there. The emerging life as it's as it's developing. And as you do that, I want you to be able to get behind the individual animals and and begin to understand you can't really see it so much but understand the dynamics that are going on in in terms of what it is what the forces are that are that are allowing this kind of continuing growth to occur it, it goes to the foundation of the nature system. And I think that's really what, what I want to be able to get at. It's not a theological issue. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got to do with the, the true foundational nature of reality. And it reality says something... Life. Exactly. It says something very specific about reality, which is that it it not only feeds upon itself, it emerges from itself. Now, what are the what is it that makes that happen? There, there are underlying principles or laws or or actions or processes that are going on that you have the ability to be able to put to work in that tank. So when you put together the components of, of this a food web, deep substrate, natural system, you're putting more in than a bunch of elements. You're putting forces and dynamics in that are at work that are causing things to happen. Give you a very, very simple, kind of a gross example of what I'm talking about. And maybe this will trigger. <clears throat> I uh, Over the last couple of days, starting about three days ago, I had a sudden flush of house flies. Oh, yeah. And, and in one day, I must have had 200 house flies. They were covering the windows. I was going around with a fly swatter and trying to get them on the door so I could open the door and open the window to get them out. Now, today there are fewer. There have been fewer and fewer. But what has happened is there is something that they're feeding on. I don't smell it. Normally I can smell things pretty well. Don't know where they're coming from. But wherever it is, there is something that died and is deteriorating. And a fly laid eggs on that. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of eggs. Tiny little eggs. Those eggs hatched. And each one of those larvae immediately began eating. So, what has happened is that little dead mouse or whatever it was has become hundreds and hundreds of flies. Literally. That's what they're composed of. Now they've got a unique genetic structure that's using that material in its own way but they're feeding on, living on, and are the product of whatever that material was. That little dead mouse is now literally hundreds of flies. Now, if you can get hold of the concept, that's really what I'm talking about. There's something that goes on in these systems whereby what we put in changes. It becomes something else. It's not suddenly that 
something is in there and it's eating and growing up. It's more than that. It's a spark of life, a different kind of life. That's what it, an egg is. It's a spark of life that is finding a food source, something it can grow on, something it can assimilate in order to become something completely different from, from what it is growing on, from what it has taken in. That's what's going on in our tanks. And I think if we get hold of that and really begin to understand that and see that, we're going to be light years ahead and understanding the life process that, that we're really trying to achieve in these aquariums. Again, it's, as I say, it's not a theological thing. It's not a religious thing. It goes, but it does go to the foundation of nature and what nature genuinely, ultimately is, which is a, a, a process that feeds upon itself and becomes something constantly different and constantly changing. So there's that sermon for the day. I like your sermons. They uh, they help me breed more fish <laughs> and keep plants alive. Right, absolutely. Yeah. What is um, this? I, you know, uh, I think the biggest part of this is my first breeding project, and um, of course, I you know, other people's first breeding projects are usually guppies or gold or something, and right, uh, you know, right, I had to right. go. I had to go for the scarlet badass. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, that was probably the easiest tank I've ever had to maintain in my life Isn't because I was, trying, yeah, I was trying to keep it. I did, wasn't trying to keep it pretty. I was just trying to keep it natural. Right. I mean, it, and the two aren't mutually exclusive. Um, but you know, I, you know, when I'm trying to keep a tank that, uh, that is natural and pretty, I do have to do a little bit of pruning. Um, for that what tank. you what you obviously did was put in that tank material that made it possible mm -hmm. for the dynamic process of life mm -hmm. to to take root I and, like and to begin full, to grow. Yeah, I like having what you would call a full ecosystem. You know, I think about uh, when I think about each role that the things in the tank have to play. Uh, the most difficult systems to maintain is when there isn't a complete ecosystem in the environment. Exactly in right. Environment. Uh, yeah. Case in point, my pea puffer tank, it is a little bit more of a maintenance for me to maintain. And that has every to do, everything to do with the fact that, that probably all this, any snails I put in there just get decimated. So <laughs> it's yeah. not impossible. It still, it has, they have their scavengers. They do have their algae eaters. Um, and they do have like, I put a bunch of scuds in there that I know are living. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a heavily predatorial tank. And so I, at the same time, I could probably stop feeding the, this tank for a year and they would, they would have enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's just, but it's still a little bit more of a high maintenance because it's easy to get one, easy to have a lesser population of, of one of the key elements, if that makes sense. Right. Monoculture, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 